you spoke about uh, engaging with a whole lot of, uh, lot of issues like uh, gender movement, caste questioning, uh, uh, the eco ecological movements, etc. in the 1980s. So, this is something which uh, you will find a lot in the poetry which you wrote in the 1980s. Will and Manila, High FM, all these poems yeah. actually reflect a lot of Along with it, then there is a very, uh, there is also a certain kind of a theoretical thing to look at what uh, you have described as Kerala you know, poetry around the language itself, understanding the roots of the language, etc. So if you could speak about that particular phase, it would be interesting. Uh, yeah, in fact, many critics have tried to divide my poetry into the poetry of the 60s, 70s, 80s, etc. And there is some truth in that, even though I, well, always, uh, there, is the, an the, there is an overlap. Uh, but as you said, yes, in the 80s, the, I, would, I would call them shifts rather than breaks. And minor uh, transitions from uh, transitions of the of uh, focus uh, from one idea to the other. So in the 80s mainly you find you know that is also a period when uh, this what if it can be called uh, regional nationalism uh, as uh, K. Venu has done uh, was an idea that was being uh, discussed uh, across uh, across Kerala. Uh, the idea of Kerala as a nation. Uh, even though now it might look a very, you know, uh, uh, kind of seditious uh, idea, uh, but uh, but what uh, but in in fact there is a kind of identity. Even if you accept fe the federal idea, which which we I think we need to because it is a constitutional idea, uh, all our states and our languages have their own you know identity. And if you look further, there will be further identities that one can derive from them. So that was the time when we were looking at what is special, what is essential to Kerala, Kerala's culture, uh, what is special about Malayalam, how is it different even from the other Dravidian languages like, uh, you know, Tamil or Telugu or Kannada. So, so there was an inquiry going on like that and, uh, uh, well, uh, I was also part of that inquiry, not as a linguist but as, as a writer, as, a, as, a, as an ordinary writer. And so that is how I came to write a lot of poems about, there is a, you know, there is, I have a long poem called Malayalam, uh, where I in fact go back to the old roots of Malayalam, I mean, right from the times of uh, Exodus and how words traveled all the way and how, and this, this remains with me, uh, the nature of Malayalam language, which is absolutely, uh, you know, uh, marvelous in the sense it's a it's a lang it's a language from which uh, we have no escape, and and because of that language we have no escape from uh, being international also, because it is an international language. Interested in that sense, but as a writer, as a creative writer, I am enamored by this whole idea of the tra of the passage of words from la one language into another. So uh, so the, the, that poem Malayalam in fact sums up all all this, uh, the is. idea of the identity of Malayalam its evolution, uh, the uh, contributions of different cultures and different languages to uh, the formation of Malayalam. Because we have, you know, we have Arab words, we have French words, we have a lot of uh, Portuguese words. Even some of our common words are Portuguese words, like Janela is a Portuguese word, for example. Uh, so there are quite a few words like that, uh, which are uh, part of our common, common speech. So the, uh, so the idea of language... So, I, so it began with a search for identity, but later I found that all identities are always in a flux and uh, uh, there is no essential identity. Ultimately, I reached also that point where I found that there is no nothing called essence. There is on, only this flux uh, because languages keep getting formed. And also there is nothing like a standard language. Even though we always speak of a standard Malayalam or standard uh, Telugu or whatever, or, or a standard English. You know how English, uh, the, the so-called uh, Kuhn's English has been challenged, uh, challenged by, from many sides, you know, by the blacks who write, uh, you know, in their own dialect, by the, by the people from the, uh, from the sidelines, you know, using their own uh, jargons and, uh, and slangs. And similarly... I believe Malayalam is also, standard Malayalam is also now being challenged by people who write in the fisherman's language, in the Marawa language and all that. So, uh, so may, maybe uh, this search for identity finally led me to a realization that, uh, well, even if there is an identity, 
it is not a permanent kind of identity it is it is the product of evolution and it is still evolving and uh, languages like cultures are always in conversation and so also in flux uh, uh, so uh, that's what i uh, that my inquiry what my inquiry ultimately led me uh, to the conclusion uh, they led me to um uh, so uh, but yes uh, so i was concerned with the language so there was another la- another poem called uh, another poem also on malayalam and there are many uh, poems where the language and uh, and and the culture comes in um, history also comes in there is a poem on on parshi raja uh, and and many other heroes of our history on some of our historical periods there are poems on our trees and our animals our flora and fauna so a, 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 a whole exploration into kerala's culture kerala's landscape kerala's poetic tradition kerala's language or languages all these uh, 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 happen to be uh, at least one of the foci of uh, my my uh, poems of uh, that particular uh, period uh, uh, other concerns like the Uh, the concern for the environment which also comes i think from the from my very roots about which i spoke at the beginning my village and the landscape which was part of my interior landscape also my spiritual landscape because i have always looked at ecology like that not as something outside only but uh, as a spiritual ecology that we need a lot so uh, so there is a there is an environment that you need to breathe to be alive to be creative to be imaginative and so that is also part of environment there is the landscape definitely the flora the fauna uh, and uh, the, the water the air uh, the uh, all that constitute what you generally call environment as a part of ecology in the proper scientific sense but there is also this inner ecology of relationships of uh, of uh, emotions of thoughts of what you read of uh, of uh, what the world gives you and what you give the world so there is also that uh, spiritual ecology and so so environment in the or ordinary sense and in this deeper spiritual sense has always been uh, pa- uh, part of my my concern and woman i have i have a lot of poems on women yeah, you you uh, spoke about kaitam so there are there are quite a few poems even even recently i wrote a poem called a, G- a girl of 13 uh saying that a girl of 13 is not a girl of 13 i mean not not a boy of 13 uh, so so there are so, uh, several poems on uh, on uh, women uh, i mean women solitude the women's relationships the the the, uh, the 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 difficulties of those relationships so that has been again uh, a, a continuous concern uh, it does not have much to do with uh, feminism in the uh, in the theoretical sense but it's, it is more to do with maybe my own experiences with uh, my my uh, friends who are women or with my my sisters my own rela- my own relatives so also uh, it has much to do with all that and uh, so there are uh, quite a few poems uh, around around women so women environment language well these have been a kind of abiding concerns in in my poetry they, they were there in the beginning but as you said uh, they come to the fore when i come to the 80s and the uh, and the 90s and now you had another question yeah i mean the last three decades the most recent three decades you have been a poet of delhi or poet in the sense that there is a constant uh, attempt to find a language of resistance look at the indian traditions create an alternate universe of spirituality and you draw in a lot of people and in and on um, the tukara uh, there are so many poems where you sp- and they speak as the voice speaking about an alternate spiritual universe and then as you said i mean you go back to rama in and look for newer kind of you know versions of rama so you speak about this yeah i moved to delhi in 1992 Uh, when i was invited uh, to be the editor of indian literature invited i said because uh, there was an interview and all that but practically i, I was uh, asked by my friend and mentor uh, dr ayappa panikar to go and try the job and professor indraj choudhury who was the secretary of uh, the sahitya academy at that time also insisted i come and try uh, so i uh, i was passing through a period of uh, dejection and disappointment at that particular point of time after the breakdown of the cultural forum and so i thought a change uh, might perhaps do me good 
and so I came over uh, on leave from my college for a year. I, I, I then I took up this job of editing the journal Indian Literature. And after one year, I took a voluntary retirement from my college and decided to continue uh, in Delhi. So I wanted to uh, bring about certain changes in Indian literature. I introduced many uh, new columns. I introduced interviews. I introduced special columns for women. I had special issues on women's writing, special issues on Dalit writing, which were, I mean, uh, which were quite new to the academy in those days because uh, there was no, nothing like Dalit writing which was accepted by the Sahitya Academy in those days. And uh, so some of the ideas uh, uh, I tested there, which I, in, in fact, uh, you know, developed further when I became the uh, secretary, the, uh, who happened to be the executive head of the academy. Yeah, I always had an interest in Indian literature, uh, because I, and I had read a lot of masterpieces of Indian literature in translation, um, even in my student days. But uh, coming to Delhi, in fact, uh, uh, I gave it uh, a, a, a new kind of impetus. I, I was reading more, uh, uh, both in English translation and in whatever little Hindi I know. And I also got to know Indian writers uh, more intimately after coming to Delhi. I knew some of them because I was connected with Bharat Bhavan in Gopal and I had met quite a few of them there. But coming to Delhi, I was able to meet uh, many of the writers in almost all the major languages of uh, uh, India uh, who would come to uh, Delhi uh, for uh, you know, seminars and uh, readings and other kinds of programs that the academy regularly had. Uh, opened a new window, in fact, into the several languages of India and their rich traditions and rich literatures. That was one way in which uh, coming to Delhi uh, impacted uh, my... Uh, understanding of literature and my uh, outlook uh, on uh, Indian literature in, in general. And editing the journal, of course, helped because the journal uh, published translation from all these languages. So. And uh, secondly, it affected my poetry in very profound ways. Uh, well, I did write poems like uh, The Indian Poet. I had written uh, strangely, the poems on Kabir and on Meera while I was in Kerala before moving to Delhi. Uh, because I had already begun to take an interest in uh, Bhakti literature while I was in Kerala. Uh, and it had its own politics. Because I felt, because I had been writing about uh, the dangers of Hindutva ideology uh, even uh, from the 1980s, uh, my articles in the Madhubhumi Weekly and in some of the books, etc., uh, try to expose uh, the absolute hollowness of that ideology. But I felt that I could not fight that ideology with uh, a European idea of uh, secularism. Uh, perhaps I had to go back to Gandhi. Even in those days, I had begun to think like that. And I had to uh, find out how Gandhi was able to bring all these Indian communities together in a common struggle for uh, freedom. And, uh, and for that, you need to understand uh, Indian culture and in Indian all kinds of religions in India much better. And you also need to understand what is called uh, Hindu tradition in general, what I would call uh, the larger Indian tradition. I knew there was a culture of polemics. I knew it was not a monolithic culture. There was no monolithic philosophy or a, or a single book that united all of us. I knew that there were different systems of uh, philosophy. We had Sankhya and we had Vaisheshika and we had Ch Charvaka. Uh, we had, uh, you know, uh, scientists like Kanada. Uh, we had also, uh, um, you know, women, uh, women philosophers and thinkers. And uh, so we had uh, different systems. We had the Buddhist and the uh, Jaina traditions. And so it was not a single system. Uh, so it was a kind a poly systemic culture, philosophically speaking. And it was a poly ethnic culture. If you look at uh, the various races uh, which have come to India from different parts of India, about which our awareness is now uh, increasing with a lot of new discoveries. Uh, our culture is not, uh, I always believed that, but I knew it now very closely and uh, really that ours was a monolingual culture, a, I mean, ours was a multilingual culture, a multi-religious culture, a multi-ethnic culture. Uh, and so uh, we had an India, we, we did not have a single India, we had many Indias, but all of which coalesced into our idea of India. So the problem is not with uh, the idea of India, but the 
the, the different ideas of India. Uh, I, I began to read more uh, Bhakti and Sufi poets. Uh, and uh, the Sahitya Academy Library, that we was a wonderful repository of, uh, you know, various kinds of collections by, you know, Lalit from Kashmir, from Andal and Avayar and Namadev and Tukaram and, and Kabir and Chokhamela and all, I mean, all those major, uh, various poets uh, of uh, different languages. Uh, I, of course, I found that, I, I'm not saying that all these poets wrote in the same way. In fact, they discovered uh, very, uh, different kinds of forms, you know, there was uh, uh, the Marathi Abhang or there was Kabir's Doha and uh, Urat Basi, various kinds of forms. So, uh, on, on the one hand, it was an aesthetic uh, training uh, in discovering these various, uh, various kinds of forms uh, and uh, they did not belong to the same uh, kind of cult either. You know, there were Shaivites, there were Shatayas, there were Vaishnavites, uh, so there were different kinds of poets and there were Sufis who tried to uh, bring about some kind of an integration between uh, uh, the philosophy of Islam and uh, Indian philosophy as they understood it. Uh, what was common to them was, one, an interrogation of the caste system and Varna system that uh, existed so strongly and so badly in, in their times. Uh, most of them, of course, there were some exceptions, but I would I would generally say most of these bhakti poets uh, you know, questioned the Varna system because they believed that if God had created human beings equally, there is no logic in believing in different Varnas or different uh, different castes and all that. So they rejected that. Secondly, uh, out of compulsion, in fact, because they wanted to speak to the people they began to use their mother tongues uh, to, in, uh, to compose poems. I would not say to write, because many of them did not actually write. Many of them just uh, sang uh, these verses. So they began to uh, um, uh, sing or compose in their mother tongues. And these mother tongues were not often standard languages, you know. Uh, they could be, uh, for example, Braj language. So, uh, and they would also change their languages when they would move from one place to play uh, one place to another uh, to, to compose in their their own languages and they did two things by that one they chant the hegemony of sanskrit secondly they established these languages as literary languages that's why we all often call our education the the very father of malayalam language so many of these bhakti poets established their own mother tongues as major literary languages in which you could convey any kind of thought, metaphysical or material. Uh, and they also, uh, 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 in, in some way, spoke in their own language, they spoke about uh, uh, egalitarianism. Today we would call it socialism. So they spoke about the equality of all human beings. And that, thus they were questioning not only the caste hierarchy, but also various other kinds of power hierarchies that uh, existed. You might have heard of many Bhakti poets challenging the king. You know, Kabir was asked to go to the court of the king and he said, I have only one king and, and uh, that, uh, that king is not this earthly king. So this, this kind of a, uh, the, the, the possibility of challenging uh, power, uh, earthly power in all its forms, in, its, in the caste form, in the, uh, the royal power, the power of money, so they, uh, they uh, continually challenged all forms of material power. And through that, they also proposed uh, uh, and established the logically and aesthetically the equality of all human beings. These were the three main things they did. Of course, they, uh, so they challenged the priesthood, they challenged the, uh, the uh, various kinds of hierarchies of power and of money, uh, the material. They challenged forms of material power, they challenged the hierarchy of Sanskrit, they challenged the caste system and the Varna system, and that is what makes it an alternative tradition. A question, a tradition of uh, interrogation, of argument, of uh, rejection of whatever they found to be false and superficial and unnecessary, and an acceptance of whatever they found to be essential to uh, spirituality. 
which uh, which to them was this equality of human beings or the or the or the fraternity of the brotherhood or sisterhood of all the human beings so and that i think is the core of of bhakti so it is not necessary to be a bhakta in the contemporary sense of the word to understand or to appreciate bhakti poetry t s eliot has said it beautifully when he speaks about the bhagavad gita it is not necessary uh, to believe in a particular religion to to experience uh, the spirituality of a particular kind of text and uh, and i have always uh, said that well i am spiritual without being religious uh, and i i mean it, it, it is in it is in this sense that if you if you can believe in the ultimate equality of all human beings if you can believe in the uh, possibility of a harmony between nature and man um, i mean human being not male and and if you can establish uh, a kind of a relationship uh, between the individual and uh, and the larger cosmos well that is spiritual and in that sense all poetry all creativity is ultimately spiritual But for me it was a great discovery that we had another tradition that could challenge uh this concept of uh, the kind of narrow insular uh, non secular concept of religion that uh, the the champions of hindutva are now putting forward that was uh, the, the the political importance of uh, my writing uh, all those poems about maybe something like 15 poems on the different uh, uh, bhakti and sufi poets uh, from bulesha to uh, namdev and kabir and tyagaraja and and the importance also of my in, intellectually the importance of my discovery of this uh, counter uh, tradition and uh, so there also delhi played a major role i wrote those two poems while i was in kerala but perhaps i would not have developed it into a series had i not come to delhi and had i not read all these various you know bhakti and sufi poets and discovered what was uh, common to all of them yeah, and I mean, then delhi yeah, yeah and then delhi also gave me another perspective uh, of being away from kerala of looking at kerala and kerala's culture and kerala's politics uh, from a distance with some kind of detachment which is which i which i think very difficult to do when you are, when you live uh, inside kerala what, what uh, some of the things we thought were big i found very small when i looked from here so that so that way also it helped me develop a kind of uh, detached uh, intimacy with the kind of objectivity uh, with a kind of detachment so on the one hand i was nostalgic in some sense it gave me uh, some uh, many of my poems on kerala and on malayalam i wrote after coming to delhi i would not have written that poem on malayalam if i had lived in kerala on the one hand it did that it made my relationship with kerala more intimate on the other hand it also gave me the advantage of looking at uh, uh, kerala the language the culture the uh, um, uh, literature etc more objectively with greater detachment uh, without any uh, any kind of uh, complacency or uh, vanity the poems come to me uh, uh, as a single image a single line and sometimes even a single word which may be the title of that poem and many of them come to me uh, strangely in the early morning early morning can also mean 2 o'clock in the morning and uh, my wife very well knows that some, suddenly sometimes i wake up and you know i go to the table and i write down something it could be a line it could be an image uh, it could be uh, a, a word that suddenly occurred to me and later uh, sometimes it develops not always sometimes it develops into a poem in the, uh, the next day or after a few sometimes after a few days when i look at it i don't even know what i Uh, i i had written and what i had meant but sometimes and and very often uh, yes uh, they uh, this image develops into a whole poem or a line or a or a or a title that develops into a poem that has been one of my modes uh, and perhaps an equally important component of your writer is it was your translations hmm. and the role you have done to malayalam literature as a translator translating from latin american writers translating european writers indian writers So how do you look at this whole process of translation? Do you pick a single uh, poet and do their work, or uh, is there a certain kind of? Uh... There is a, there is an impulse uh, there also, because when I read a poet, or maybe a few poems, or even a single poem by a poet, I feel like translating that into Malayalam. I feel that well, Malayalis deserve uh, to read uh, this poem. 
and then of course i come across all the challenges that uh, translators particularly translators of poetry come across the challenge of the sound of the poem the challenge of the syntax of the of the structure of that particular language all those and and one one fi- one negotiates you know one finds one way through the lines and the words and finally uh, uh, after many corrections and revisions you arrive at uh, a kind of translation um but my translations uh, had many many kinds of motivations one is of course the desire to enrich my language it is also a great training for an actual poet for a practicing poet the great training line by line the way he must have imagined this line the why he must have chosen this particular word in that context why did he repeat that word twice or thrice in the same poem so and why did he use this particular rhyme or rhythm pat, or this particular structure and pattern in that poem so it is an intimate study of that is why gayatri spivak has called translation intimate reading so translation is in fact a kind of intimate reading you are uh, closely reading a poem and that is a great tra- that, that has been my second motive enriching language then enriching myself in a way that is by by training myself as a uh, as a poet and thirdly trying the strength of malayalam because malayalam is supposed to be a small language compared to a big international language like english or like french or spanish and all that can malayalam take a poet like rilke for example or vayeho a very very difficult poet or porcelain a very difficult german poet can malayalam with all its limitations uh, absorb carry all those nuances of their poetry and i have found it can and that, so so uh, that that also gives you a kind of confidence as a poet uh, how central has been your family to this whole journey as a writer as a person yeah i i don't think with one without my family without the support of my wife and my uh, daughters i would not have been a writer uh, that uh, that is something i would uh, any any day confess that you know uh, because they have given me time to write they have uh, given me the leisure given me the moral support to write thank you so much sir it's been a great uh, learning experience with you